Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, I'm going to be looking at uh, one of the requests that I had from one of the viewers on the last video was, hey, could you could you take a look at uh, New Shell? And so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to take a look at New Shell uh, right after this. <laughs> I got this uh, this this uh, comment on, I believe this came in on the uh, GNU Herd video. This is from Ep uh, Kajeltzer, I think his name is. He said, I would love to hear your thoughts on New Shell. It's a new shell intended to bring all power and convenience of the shell into an updated, more consistent and discoverable intuitive form. I particularly love its first-class support for structured data and the emphasis on legibility. So, okay, fine, we'll take a look at it. And and uh, but first of all, I think I think that probably the first thing we ought to do here is talk a little bit about some of the goals and the purpose behind all of this. So the uh, the the goals of the project is to take the Unix philosophy of shells where pipes connect simple commands together and bring it into a modern style of development. Thus, rather than being either a shell or a programming language, New Shell connects both by bringing a rich programming language and a full-featured shell together into one package. That is from the New Shell book on their website, and it describes kind of what their goals were in kind of a general statement that, you know, they want to... They want to be able to improve on something while still adhering to the traditional Unix philosophies. So, yeah, all right. So first thing you would need to do is uh, you can install New Shell on Linux, Mac OS, or even Windows. And the current release of the software is 0.72.1 at the time that I'm making this video today. You'll find packages for x86-64 ARM, and ARM actually has two flavors. One is the 64-bit or uh, ARCH64 and the 32-bit, which is ARM7H. Now, ARM7H is quickly disappearing as uh, more of the distros are starting to drop ARM7H. So, yeah, you can still find it on the Raspbian OS, and that would be like a, that architecture would be like the Raspberry Pi 2 or below. Raspberry Pi 3 and 4 both use 64-bit uh, BCM uh, ARM chips. You can also, so how do you get it to install on Mac OS? Well, to do that, you're going to have to install Homebrew, which is a pa the, the package manager that Apple forgot, right? Uh, which allows you to bring in packages externally into uh, the Mac OS. You can also install it on Windows using one of three ways. You can install it with Winglet, Chocolatey or Scoop, and that will give you the binaries for Windows as well. New is still in development, and, and it may not be stable for everyday use. I guess the, the best way to take a look at this thing is let's go to, let's go deploy it and, and let's see what happens. I'm going to be using Asahi Linux today, which of course is an ARM-based uh, operating system that runs on Mac. This is a, a Mac Mini M1. Uh, it's one I've been using for some time. So let's go set up and uh, and I'll be right back and uh, we can try that. Well, the first thing is there's the, the web page uh, that you would go to. It's, uh, it's newshell.sh. And they kind of give you some examples here. And it talks about pipes, pipelines to control any operating system. Everything is data. Uh, that's a little bit different from the, the Unix philosophy where everything is a file. And then there are plugins that can be used to extend New Shell into providing additional support. So the book uh, will get you, has a getting started, talks about installing it. There's a quick tour. We'll go through some of that today. I'm under a Bash shell at the moment. So let's, uh, let me get my microphone, ex put it over here. So, so yeah, this is a, a, a traditional born shell environment. Uh, and so, all right, so all I have to do is put in new. The first time you run this is it will ask you about creating two files. One is the env new and the other one is the config new. 
at the end, I explain what those two are, but it'll also ask you where you want them stored. So the first thing we want to do, let's just do the, the simple ls command, and you'll notice it comes up similar to the, when we were doing the demos on the uh, Rust uh, replacement uh, commands for Linux. So, yeah, it, it gives you, this is interesting that it numbers all of these down here on the left-hand side, and then it gives you the name, the type, the size, modified. I believe there's additional information, of course, you can print out here as well. So the other the other thing is I can, you know that in the LS, you could reverse order the sort that way. Uh, but in, that does not have any meaning to New Shell, as you can see, it, it will tell you. If you want to know about this, how the command syntax is, you can just do a help on the LS. So normally in the bash shell, you would do something like this or something like that. But yeah, new shell doesn't work that way. So uh, you, you type in commands and the LS command is internal. It it's inside of the new shell. Now I don't know if it's actually a module or it's a, or how it compiled in because it doesn't say. But one thing, uh, maybe it does up here. Let's look. No, nope, it doesn't say. So it shows you kind of the, what flags you can use, and then they have patterns which allow you to uh, drill down into your choices. But the rest of them use pipes in order to augment the capabilities of LS. So, and that is one of the things that we're going to do here. We're going to look for size greater than 1 KB. And that's it. Oops. I lost my B. There we go. Uh, and then it will show you only the files that are greater than 1 KB, and we can see that here. But what if I want to, um, what if I want to sort by size? What if I don't want to do that? What if I just want to see that and then print it in reverse order? Uh, you can see that now we're tracking from the largest files all the way down to the smallest. If I leave that last bit off, it should it should list them in uh, the reverse order, which is to go from smallest to largest. Your old file, your old commands, by the way, are still here. You just have to call them up using their long path names. Now, I'm sure you could alias those, like maybe, yeah, and do that So uh, if you want. So let's take a look at their PS command. Uh, same thing, you'll see it's printed in this block format, which re reminds me of curses so much. So I've got quite a bit running on this machine at the moment, and uh, it indicates the PID, the name of the process, its status, the amount of CPU percentage that this particular process is taking, the amount of mem memory, and the amount of virtual memory that it's taking as well. Uh, so yeah, we can we can do that. So you can do the same thing here where I can do, if I don't know what all the options are for PS, there's a, a long form, let's try that, which, does it, does it really give me that much more information? The other command that they show you in the in the in the book is uh, uh, piping the output of PS to where, which will then qualify it to look for CPU times over five. So if I have something that's taking over five percent of the CPU, it will list them. Helpful if you're trying to find you know what's taking why your system is so slow. And you're trying to find out which. Which, uh, which artifact is making it <laughs> sluggish. Uh, also, you have, um, I don't believe this one is, well, I, I think this one is built in. Let's do it. Yeah, this one is built in as well. So I have date, and then there's, you can format it. You can do it in humanized format. And we'll just do it now. And that looks kind of like the same output as 
In fact, it's very similar, except I get a readable CST instead of the minus 0600 for the time zone. The other, the other example they show here is typing it to date and then putting it back into table form. Uh, so you can do that as well. Also, there, your sys commands uh, will we'll also print in a formatted. This, I mean, I, I don't mind this. This is all right. So, okay, fair enough. Uh, you can also pull out pieces of information out of that by, again, piping the output. If we just want the host session name, I can get those. And that's indicating who's running those, who, <clears throat> how many users are running processes it doesn't show you how many processes each user is running, but it does show you that uh, from a general point of view, it's showing that the that there are three sessions in progress. That you know you have the help commands that are available to you. It's not a traditional man format, more like a til a til til deer uh, uh, format. So when you if you saw the video on the rest replacement commands, you probably noticed some of that. So what else can we do with LS? I mean, we, we've got that, right? If I'm looking for specific files, let's just do shell because I know I have a bunch of those out here in the, in the directory. So, uh, and then it'll show you, you know, you can look for certain things. But what if you want to, if, what if you want to traverse like this? Well, I can't do that. It doesn't understand that. So they have a, a short form uh, with using uh, double double asterisk, and that means to recurse all the directories looking for shells. And yeah, I've got quite a few, about a thousand of them, um, on on this machine anyway. And that mostly has to do with Pharonix, uh that allows me to do that. So you can recurse through your subdirectories, and then it shows you the full path, which is a little nicer than some of the Linux utilities. Then you have some built-ins. Let's let's do there's change directory. There's a short form for change directory that you can do. Let's see, let me, let me see what directories I have here. Uh, how about, what's in, what's in MD RAID? All right, that's fair enough. So if I want to go to M, if I want to, if I want to traverse down into the directory, okay, uh, I can do that. I can come back up the same way using the double dots as well. And then if you want, there's a short form that'll take that'll do that without having to use the CD command. So let's do a touch A. Yep, yeah, created the file. And then we'll move A to B. And A should be gone, right? And then um, let's say I, I want to copy B back to A. Oh, it doesn't handle that. Probably have to put it. Okay, so uh, then you have, of course, the remove. I wonder if I can do that. Yep, I can. And they're gone. So new shell, as you can see, is certainly not bash. Uh, according to the website, new shell is both a programming language and a shell. So, and you can do pipelines with it. We've been kind of playing around with this all day. So the length of the output of LS, how many lines? 35. And we can test that. Yep, this is 35 there. So yeah, so that, that's how they do their pipelines. But so you're kind of you're kind of having to, to learn the way Linux does things. So let's say that I want to do something like this. where I redirect the, now, so in, in bash shell, that echo command says to print the word in quotes, which is echo, which is hello. 
And then the greater than sign says to redirect the output to j.text. Yeah, it'll list it. <laughs> it'll list it. The whole thing is an echo. So the way that they do it is a short form. You just put what you want and then do a save and tell it what file you want. Let's say. I keep wanting to put in bash shell commands. Uh, and so, yeah, there's my file. And again, let's try it that way. There we go. Now, that does not look like a built-in. That's a GNU utility. So that is a standard Unix utility that you're calling to do a cat with. So, uh, so basically, new shell adopts a functional programming style of immutable variables, and they also call those constraints. So if you're familiar with functional programming languages, uh, then new shell is kind of the new thinking for computer science, and you make your variables immutable. So uh, the other thing is that there are two files that control what new shell does. Yeah. And so the first one is env.new. We kind of touched on that. If you want to find it, you can go to dot config and then go to new shell. And in here will be your config.new and env.new. They're right here. And then your history is here as well. So the first one is the env. Let's do it. Yeah, that's okay. I think that'll work. Uh, so we can look at this is again as a standard GNU utility. So uh, in the new shell environment config files, you will find your definitions. So this is where you define your environment variables that are used throughout the programs. Anyway, this is you would put your declaratives here basically and define what variables you want to use. Now things like your path should be in here, and they are. And then they're adding directories to that path statement and plugging them in. So the other one, config.new, this is your global, uh, these are your global, your global declarations such as, these would be your defines, this would be your aliases, and any other global, uh, anything else you want to add to the global namespace for your session. So, yeah, and they have quite a bit in here. There's also, uh, there's also key bindings in here as well as uh, the colors that you would set for your themes on the, uh, uh, on your response, on your prompt, on your shell prompt. So I noticed they gave, they kind of given up on the PS1, <laughs> PS2 uh, variables for that. So it is a little, it is quite different. The other thing we need to talk about is, let me go back out of here and we'll clear this off again, is redirection. So they, they only redirect standard out and standard, and, and that's it. Standard error, they don't redirect. They, it doesn't per, currently permit that. So I can do something like that, and then it will dump the table out in. Uh, basically, that looks like key value pairs to me. So, but you can't you can't redirect standard error, and I hope they reconsider that. It would be nice if they could do that. This is according to their documentation. And the other thing that's missing is standard in. So standard in, there are times where I have redirected input into a program to do that without a pipe. Uh, because in, in, in Unix, you can do this. Uh, it'd probably be better to do, you know, if you're, if you're trying to read in something, uh, out of a file that's going into building up a config, you can do that. Or even a headers for a make file can be done that way. So, yeah, I mean, those are some handy things you can do with the redirection of standard in. I didn't see any mention of it in the manual. So I hope they add that in a future release. The other one is the exit code status, which we normally do. The short form for that is this. So anytime you you execute a program, there is a status that's tracked by uh, new shell. So to get to it though, so 
So I run my command. Right, let me clear that so we do it again. And now I have my exit cat status code. And to print it, I do that. So I get my uh, my zero for the uh, the code. Now I want to make sure <laughs> that that one, that was coming from this. So if I were to do, let's let's say, where I get. Uh, well, let's see. Ah, that should have shown the air code. Yeah, there we go. I got a one. And one equates to directory not found. But they only print. Now, this one, I don't know if they have a way to actually look up the error message. Uh, but there is a way to do that, in, of course, in Linux. The other one is to use, the other way to do this is with complete. So if I do this again. I think I did the same problem last time. Only works on, oh, only works on external streams. Okay. So I probably need something like something like that. And then it just dumps it to standard air. If I put in something that's not there, then it should print the standard error message. Yeah, so you can get you can get the standard error message. What about uh, what about decoding? So first of all, you can't you can do that now in Linux. I don't know. Do I have? K yeah, I do. I have something in there. So uh, in Linux, you have the ability to use uh, OD, which is, stands for Octal Display. The reason it's called Octal Display is in the original Unix versions were Octal based because DEC was Octal based. But as time went by, um, the Octal was replaced by ASCII and and the machines went that route as well. I, I came from the ASCII, uh, EPSIDIC world. And so Octal, I would see that we had some devices that did record in Octal that we had to translate uh, to Epsidic. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, those were, those were kind of ancient hardware that had been around for about 10 years before I started. Yeah. Most of the stuff in the sixties, early seventies, you you could run into Octal pretty, pretty frequently. But, uh, yeah, after that, when the ASCII standards and IBM started to dominate with their Epsidic standard, uh, the mainframes were all moving in that direction. It just made it easier to share data between different systems if we all if we didn't have to bother to translate anything. Anyway, so let's see, let's try this. So the short form to enter, um, this is hex. So we don't know how this is encoded because all I'm entering is hexadecimal. And I can I have a number of ways I could decode this. So let's do eight UTF eight. And by the way, so it shows you what that what that character would be, and it doesn't have one, it looks like. So I could do a help on decode, and it should give me, yeah, so they, they have some examples, but this is not complete, but they do have a complete list here. Oh, they have tons. So I suppose that the thing to do right now is to just uh, talk about some of the things that I see with this. So one of the first things I saw in the manual was they were talking about a replacement for said. And I saw that it had search and replace, but said, <laughs> said has some other really cool features. Like said, you can do mass replace in, across an entire search worth of documents. So uh, yeah, you can search across a huge number of files and do a, a replace. 
I don't know if it didn't look like that the version of New Shell does that. So you you might you might hang on to your said command <laughs> because that's a handy feature. Uh, but that's minor. All right, that's minor. Standard in needs to be defined. Standard error needs to be defined for redirection. If they're going to try to replace what the capabilities are in uh, Linux. Uh, the other thing is that the... I kind of disagree with a little bit with the philosophy of using names for the devices. The, the, here's the thing. When Unix was built, there, the, th the three things you could count on was that where did the 0, 1, and 2 come from for the standard in, standard out, standard error? And, and that is it's, standard in is 0, standard out is 1, and standard error is, three, is 2. Excuse me. So... Where did that come from? Well, those are file descriptors. <laughs> so those were always in any application that that was built on on the C compiler. Those three things were built in, and you could count on those being there. I'm not. This is not my world. This is their world now. I mean, I'm uh, I'm just we. I've had my time in working in this system, so it's your turn now. So what do I think of it overall? I think it's a great approach. I'm glad to see functional programming being used to develop the shell. They did make one comment that they, uh, they said that uh, unlike the Linux, uh, well, I don't know if it said unlike the Linux, but I think they were trying to imply that Bash didn't have a programming language. Uh, Bash is a programming language. The syntax that is in shell is Algol-like. It isn't pure Algol, but it is Algol-like. That's all I had for today. I, I hope you enjoyed this this look at New Shell. Go out and try it. Um, it's different. It's, it's different. And and uh, go through the tutorials that they have. They also have, uh, they also go into much greater depth than what I'm showing on here. How to kind of, you know, think in new ways about how to use it. I, you know, to me, the only thing that, uh, the reason why I, this is not for me. And that's all I'm going to say. The new shell is not something that I would use. And the reason for that is I, I appreciate the shorthand form of, of the Linux uh, bash uh, and the other shells too, for that matter. I just like, I just prefer the shorthand uh, and being able to use as few keystrokes as possible to get work done. Anyway, that's all I had for today. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please like and subscribe. Hope to see you all again real soon. Bye for now. Oh,